Let's talk about NIDA cannabis. This is the material that is grown on a farm at the University of Mississippi with a great deal of security around it. Um, they often um, do a crop every other year. Uh, they've mainly used um, Mexican cannabis genetics um, and they uh, reportedly manicure, that is the word that was used by NIDA in a communication to me personally, manicured material. I want you to notice that we took this last year, uh, the material was manufactured, not harvested, but manufactured uh, two years previously, but they maintain that it's stored under optimal conditions. We can look at the degradation over time, but certainly there had to be some deterioration, and the assay values that we had were done when it was manufactured. Here is uh, George with one of his typical canisters of 300 previously rolled uh, marijuana cigarettes. Bob Randall actually used the uh, joints straight out of the canister. Uh, additionally, in all the uh, programs where cannabis cannabis is being used, such as Dr. Abrams' study, his previous and uh, subsequent studies, uh, they have to use the joint right out of the canister. So here, inhale, exhale. This is how the medicine works. <laughs> this is a close-up of the uh, night of cannabis. I want you to notice there is material there that doesn't belong, stem, seed, Big seed. Um, it, yeah, it doesn't look so good. Um, we have here a picture of uh, a whole bunch of the cannabis uh, cigarettes with a palm mall. You'll notice that it fits right in, except for the logo. In fact, they use the same kind of machine. Uh, it is the same paper. Uh, the patients uniformly hate this paper. It's very harsh and a lot of them, again, prefer to re-roll. Again, uh, one excuse that NIDA has given for not using stronger potency cannabis, uh, they told me that they had material available up to 5% THC, but their machine couldn't roll it. And I felt like saying, give it to me, I remember how to do it. <laughs> so, uh, a year ago tomorrow, we were in my uh, living room and dissecting uh, the NIDA cannabis for these pictures. And this is the contents of three NIDA joints. And this is the debris they're from. And we didn't sift this. This is just what was grossly... Uh, that's a close-up. This is what your government thinks uh, medicinal marijuana uh, should be. And uh, these are stems and seeds from three joints. Um, I seem to recall when I was in college that uh, if you left these in, you were ostracized from your social group. <laughs> um, I've never heard anybody, any claim in all the thousands of years of uh, clinical cannabis history that we have, that smoking a tree is uh, conducive to any health benefit. <laughs> Um, this uh, I calculated out of uh, one of Bob Randall's books. Uh, through the Freedom of Information Act, in 1978, he was able to find out what the cost was uh, for the feds to produce cannabis. Basically, for cultivation and production, it was 90 cents an ounce in 1978, and it was estimated that two-thirds of the cost was attributable to security. You know, the electric fence and the wire, uh, razor wire and everything else that you need. Um, and the true cost of cultivation in 1978 was one cent a gram, or one cent per joint. Um, despite uh, some time passing and some uh, inflation, it should not be that much greater today, and with the capability of doing a much better job. In case you forgot, <laughs> I wanted to show this picture of what real uh, medicinal cannabis uh, is supposed to look like. First of all, they're not supposed to be any seeds. The medicinal part of cannabis is uh, the unfertilized flowering top, or if you wish, a virgin female 
Notice the tremendous amount of uh, glandular trichomes, or quote, crystals, unquote, here, and not a seed to be seen. Um, I like to think of this as nature's highest expression of unrequ unrequited female sexual passion. <laughs> in, in 1985, the government decided that we're going to take care of this cannabis issue once and for all. And the way they thought they'd do this is by producing synthetic THC. Now normally it would have been pretty easy to grow cannabis and isolate THC, uh, but they didn't want to do that. They wanted to make a distinction that THC in cannabis was Schedule 1, but when you made it synthetically and put it in a capsule with sesame oil, it was Schedule 2. Or, in 1999, it became Schedule 3. Well, that isn't scientific. It may be bureaucratic, but it's not scientific. I like to think of Marinol as the caviar of prescription medicines. We have the 2.5 uh, milligram, the 5, and the 10 milligram. These babies, uh, which look like uh, salmon roll, uh, are $17 per capsule. Uh, as we've heard previously, this is not a very good medicine. I'm a neurologist. Um, I've actually used Marinol fairly extensively in my chronic pain population. I've tried it in movement disorders, a variety of patients. Sometimes it's helpful, uh, sometimes and mostly it's not. Uh, as we've heard, uh, THC, when taken orally in isolation, is converted by the liver to 11-hydroxy-THC, which is five to eight times more psychoactive than THC that's smoked. And even experience, experienced cannabis smokers get too high and often do not function well on Marinol. Also, patients don't get the ability to titrate. It may be too little or too much, and they can't do anything about it. They're stuck with it for hours. Um, I personally have never had a patient who took Marinol and used clinical cannabis, smoke, or vaporized uh, that preferred Marinol, not one. Um, three of our four study patients used Marinol either to tide them over when they were traveling or to try it uh, and found no efficacy for their disorders. Uh, George uh, was never offered it and uh, <coughs> rightly points out that he couldn't afford it if he had been. Conclusions from the study, and I'm just going to read this. Uh, cannabis smoking, even of a crude, low-grade product, provides effective symptomatic relief of pain, muscle spasms, and intraocular pressure elevations in selected patients failing other modes of treatment. These clinical cannabis patients are able to reduce or eliminate other prescription medicines and their accompanying side effects. Clinical cannabis provides an improved quality of life in these patients. The side effect profile of NIDA cannabis and chronic usage suggests a mild pulmonary risk. No malignant deterioration has been observed. No consistent or attributable neuropsychological or neurological deterioration has been observed. No endocrine, hematologic, or immunologic sequelae have been observed. Improvements in a clinical cannabis program would include a ready and consistent supply of sterilized, potent, organically grown, unfertilized female flowering top material, thoroughly cleaned of extraneous inert fibrous matter. I don't think that they got a passing grade. <laughs> it is the author's opinion that the compassionate IND should be reopened and extended to other patients in need of clinical cannabis. Failing that, local, state, and federal laws might be amended to provide regulated and monitored clinical cannabis to suitable candidates. The government has resisted any such effort. I would like to thank the patients again. Uh, certainly none of this would have happened without uh, Robert Randall. We'd like to dedicate this study to him. We, I'm very pleased to say, got uh, nice financial support from this, from John Gilmore, uh, Preston Parrish, uh, the Zimmer Family Foundation. I'd also uh, like to thank um, Don Merchafter, who uh, got this uh, going through, uh, and Rick Doblin from MAPS uh, for uh, helping out. Thank you.